Hello, I'm Zachary Dolan, production lead at PAC TV. The English philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon said knowledge is power. At PAC TV, we believe it is our responsibility to bring informational programming to residents and voters so you can make informed decisions about issues that impact your community and about candidates wishing to serve. I'd like to thank the candidates for participating in this forum and being committed to an open discussion about their stand on various issues. I'm joined tonight by Melissa Matinzi, Programming Manager at PAC TV. We will be acting as moderators for this forum. We are also joined by the candidates for two positions on the Plymouth Select Board, Alan Costello, Patrick Flaherty, Sheila Joyce, Frank Mand, and Anthony Provenzano. The following format will be used in tonight's forum. Each candidate will be introduced in alphabetical order and will have two minutes to introduce themselves, share why they are running for the select board, and tell viewers about their qualifications for the position. The candidates will then be asked several questions related to local issues. With each question, we will rotate who will be given the opportunity to answer first. Candidates will have two minutes to respond. At the end of the forum, each candidate will have two minutes to make their closing remarks. A countdown clock in the studio is being used. We ask that all candidates respect these timelines in order to keep this forum fair and balanced for all candidates. This will not be a debate. It is an opportunity for candidates to let voters know who they are and where they stand on certain issues. Ready to begin? We begin tonight with your opening remarks. Candidates, you will each have two minutes. We will begin with Alan Costello. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank PAC TV for the invitation for tonight's candidates forum. My name is Alan Costello. I'm 57 years old, and I'm a candidate for one of the two spots on the select board this May 18th. I'm a longtime resident of Plymouth, having lived here for nearly four decades, raising my family in the West Plymouth section of town. I'm also the owner of a construction telecommunications business that I've operated here in town for the last 28 years. Over the many years, I've made it a point to attend the meetings of various boards associated with town government. And in 2014, I was elected to town meeting representing Precinct 10. I was also appointed to the Conflict of Interest Committee later that same year. In 2015, I was elected by my peers to be the Precinct Chair of Precinct 10 and to represent Precinct 10 at the Committee of Precinct Chairs. 2018, I was nominated and elected to the chairmanship position of the Committee of Precinct Chairs. It has always been my goal to devote my time and experience to Plymouth Town Government to help address the issues that concern the taxpayers of Plymouth. I hope it's clear to all the candidates that over the next two to three budget cycles, difficult choices will have to be made that will shape the future of Plymouth for the taxpayers of our town. From the ever-expanding town budget to the skyrocketing cost of deferred building maintenance, the sewer debacle, and the shocking lack of commercial development, it's very clear that the residents of Plymouth know that change is needed. They are watching. Residents are frightened by the increases of their taxes, and, and they want results. Two minutes are up. That's why I'm a candidate for the select board. Thank we'll you. now move on to Patrick Flaherty. Hi, my name is Patrick Flaherty and I'm running to be the next member of our select board. I see your questions as the first step to finding answers together. The select board works for all of you. This is your town. I want to bring my skills and experience as a leader to the select board to contribute to the solutions of the tough issues that we're all facing right now in town. Um, personally, I live near downtown with my wife, Lindsay, our dog, Sanka, and our bunny, Yule Bunner. My Parents live in Plymouth. I have friends, colleagues, coworkers that live here. You know, Plymouth is home. Uh, my previous job, I worked with large cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Atlanta, Chicago, and other cities like Somerville, and other ones never heard of across the Midwest, to where I led teams to improve municipal operations. Uh, in 2014, I started my company, Guided Living Senior Home Care. We now have over 100 employees, and we're growing every week. And uh, through my company, we provide in-home care to elders from a little bit of extra help to around-the-clock care. Um, the town of Plymouth is a multi-million dollar organization that does require visionary leadership. I will bring my experience as a service provider 
and as a business leader to the select board. Uh, you can find out more about me at patrickforblimouth.com. And thank you for your questions this evening. We'll now move on to Sheila. Thank you. Thanks again to PAC TV for sponsoring the first debate of this campaign season. And thank you to the viewers who are tuning in. Let me introduce myself. My name is Sheila Joyce. I'm completing my first term as a member on the select board in Plymouth. Prior to that, I was a member of the town's finance committee, as well as a town meeting member who served multiple terms. Let me share with you all why I'm running for the board again. I've been a resident in town for 16 years. I've seen many changes in the town. In my opinion, many are positive and exciting, but some are also worrisome. The town's budget for FY20 is $247 million. That's a scary number. Residential taxes continue to go up. Entergy is shutting the power plant, producing operations soon. The school population continues to go down. The $48 million sewer break is still a cloud over us, especially as the Veolia contract winds down two years from now. The town's excess tax levy capacity is the lowest in over 15 years. We're, are we looking at a Prop 2.5 override in the next couple of years? The town's population is over 60,000 people, but the town is green. Almost 40% of the town is over 55 years old. How do we also address their needs? How can we increase revenue that's not placed on the real estate tax bills? We need to be practical in how we can create new commercial, non-residential sources of revenue while at the same time respecting our environmental and natural assets. I believe with my experience and knowledge, we can continue to work together to help Plymouth stay healthy so we can try to work on addressing these opportunities and challenges. I take seriously my responsibilities as being a board member. I research and do fact finding to make the best decision. Thank you for having us. Now we'll move on to Frank Mann. Good evening, my name is Frank Mann. I'm a candidate for select person. We often ask young children what they want to be when they grow up and we laugh at their answers. But it's a serious question. So what does Plymouth want to be when it grows up? A collection of strip malls? The cheapest town in the county? The answer is right in front of us, but we often don't see the forest for the trees. Miles Stanish State Forest, the Eel River Restoration, the Living Observatory, the Wildlands Trust and their new headquarters, Ellisville Harbor, the Pine Barrens Alliance, the Herring Pond Watershed Association. We are already an environmental hub, a center for green innovation, In its first year of operation, Mass Audubon's Wildlife Sanctuary attracted 35,000 visitors. If your son or daughter were six foot 10 inches tall, you would dig deep to find the resources to get them into a specialty basketball camp so that they might reap the rewards and have a career. What does Plymouth want to be when it grows up? Where are its resources focused? Leadership begins with vision. Let's get started. Now we move on to Anthony Provenzano. Thank you, thank you. I'm Tony Provenzano. Thank you, <coughs> PAC-TV, and thank you, Zach, and thank you, Melissa. Uh, six years ago, when I was first elected to the select board, I could hardly imagine the varied issues that would come before the board and the challenges that we would face. Although I had been a town meeting member for over a decade, had been on the finance committee and chaired the finance committee for some time, the sheer breadth and variety of the issues uh, were really astonishing. Uh, I think I've constructively met those challenges and I've been a positive member of the board and I'd like to continue. As a practicing attorney, uh, I've, been, I've lent my expertise to the town in helping to deal with some of the uh, issues like the, uh, the leases in the downtown. Uh, these leases of waterfront property and downtown property are a, a tremendous resource and it's important that we act as responsible stewards. The failure of the sewer force main a subsequent town response, the planning and the repair averted an environmental catastrophe. The complex lawsuit now underway in the Superior Court um, has been going on for the main part of the, my tenure on the board. It's entering a critical stage of negotiation towards a subsequent, uh, towards a settlement which uh, could affect and benefit the town greatly. I would like to very much be part of the board uh, when these negotiations are underway. The Entergy Nuclear Power Plant is about to transition from an operating power plant to decommissioning. Again, there are varied forces at work, the NRC, the state, Holtec, Entergy. Um, all these uh, players um, 
will make decisions that will affect this town. I would very much like to be on the board as these decisions are being made because I think my expertise and my hard work uh, will go a long way towards uh, a productive solution. So uh, thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your opening comments. We'll now move to Melissa for the first question. Thanks, Zach. The discussion of town governance and the form it should take to meet the needs of this community has been an ongoing and sometimes contentious discussion. The Commonwealth recommends that a community of more than 35,000 residents should consider reorganizing to a council-based government. Plymouth has more than 60,000 residents. There is a current movement to form a new charter commission to examine this issue. What are your thoughts about the appropriate form of government for the town, given its population and needs? We'll begin with Patrick Flaherty. Thank you. Well, first, you know, just to be clear, I'm running for the select board. And so that the question for me comes down to two kind of camps that I've been talking to many people across town. And that's, you have the idea that we are a very large geographic town, very large with population. And on the town meeting form, you have the idea that to get representation across the entire town equally, we have our precincts, we are guaranteed that we have representative and very participatory government. Now we know that our twice a year with a third optional meeting can be less than efficient at times. So the question that I, I think it's worth exploring because that's what we're all about. We're out to see, this would be ultimately a vote of the people to see if it should be converted to the, um, the council form. And I, I think, I think it's, it's worthwhile to explore all the options and then see what it looks like because it's a very complicated issue. If we turn to a different form, it affects the uh, amounts of funding and things that we can get. So it's not, a very, it's not a simple process. I would want to learn all of the aspects of the pros and cons of both sides down to those levels, including the funding we would get from each side to then make a decision. And then it would go towards the town, the people to vote. So uh, for me, it's efficiency versus participation. And both have their pros. Thank you. We'll move on to Sheila Joyce. Thank you, Melissa. It's a, uh, as Patrick said, we're running for a seat on the select board, so kind of an ironic question, but an understandable question. Um, summer of 2017, I participated in a Charter Review Commission. They invited present selectmen and past selectmen, and so that was one of the questions they had posed to us. And I shared then, and I will share tonight, that I don't think it's the most efficient form of government. As you said, 35,000, we're at 60,000, we're $250 million budget. Um, how do you include everybody to have their say? I grew up in the city of Boston, mayor, city councilors that represented the whole city, as well as representatives that uh, represented specific parts. So there's too much going on in town just to have two town meetings a year. Get the facts, get it put on the ballot. I know there's talk about putting it on the ballot, I believe, in 2020, and let the voters decide there, ultimately, the recipients of which decision and which way to go. Thank you. We'll move on to Frank Mann. I feel very strongly that we should retain our present form of government. It's a legacy, it's historic, and it's the most participatory form of government in the nation. I recently walked almost a across the country, got as far as Amarillo, Texas, and I was walking to, to talk to people about community engagement. And I came across many forms of government, and none of them had the participation, the involvement, the engagement that this democratic form of government has. We have over 500 people involved on a day-to-day -day basis, citizens involved on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't get more involved than that. What a mayor or a city council form of government does is get you efficiency at the loss of transparency, at the loss of participation. I don't think that the cynicism that exists now about what government can and does for you should prevail in the discussion of what form of government we should have. If we participate more, if we're engaged more, this is the best form of government. If we don't, then essentially we're abrogating our responsibility as democratic citizens in this country. I love this form of government. It's part of the motivation that I'm here today. I'd like to retain it. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll move on to Anthony Provenzano. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Yeah, this is uh, our legacy. This uh, form of government was handed down to us essentially by the pilgrims. Uh, the pilgrims in a pilgrim contact, contact uh, in the uh, 
basically said that the law would be made, the, law, the people would be living by the rule of law and the law would be made by the community, the community at large. And that's where town meeting comes from. Um, it is a highly inefficient, but it is also the, a broad participatory form of government. Um, we could move to a city form of government. We could take on a mayor. We could take on a council. But let me just say that if voter participation rates stay where they are now, uh, you know, we're going to go to the polls in just a few weeks. Uh, and in the past, Plymouth hasn't really done very well in terms of uh, voter participation. Sometimes it's down as low as 12 percent. No form of government is going to succeed if only 12 percent of the people go out to vote. So I ask you to vote because it's the only way that any form of government is truly going to be an effective uh, uh, reflection of the want of the people. Um, if we turn to a city form of government, I think, yes, yeah, something in this town uh, will be lost forever. Um, however, uh, the next decennial census will probably add two precincts to this town, and that's going to bring even more uh, town meeting members. Not a bad thing necessarily, again, as long as there's strong citizen participation and strong voter participation. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move on to Alan Costello. Yes, I'd like to start off by saying I love the form of uh, representative town meeting. It allows me to go down to town hall, talk with others, debate with others, and vote on all, all sorts of articles throughout the town, budgetary, uh, bylaws, uh, cons conservation. Uh, so I, I want to preface what I say by I, I love the form of government. But in my life as a business owner, you'd have a very difficult time uh, running a business, running a company, $250 million on two different Saturdays a year. It's very difficult to do the the proper business, the proper work that's needed. And I think it lacks uh, efficiency. Uh, it, it lacks sometimes accountability and transparency. Uh, I have to say at this time, I'm actually going to be right in the middle of a huge conflict because uh, for, you know, uh, just to be uh, f full disclosure, I'm actually involved in that very group that you speak of on the executive board to explore the possibility to have a charter commission question on the ballot in 2020. To put the question to the voter, we have no, at this time, desire for any particular form of government. Uh, so we want to leave it to the charter commission, which would best case be formed next year, then have to probably work a year or 18 months on their own. So it's probably a two and a half, three year best case process. And we may very well come back to town meeting. We may come back to town meeting next year if it doesn't pass. But I think we are doing a disservice to the community if we don't present all the different viable options. We're actually running into some big headwinds in the next couple of years. We should be at least looking at this. Thank you. Thank you all for your responses. And Zach? We move to the second question. As Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant approaches shutdown, many residents have questions and concerns about the decommissioning process. For example, who will complete the process? A New Jersey company, Holtec, has put in a bid to purchase the property and complete the decommissioning. Residents have questions related to the spent fuel rods, future land use, and spending. Please share your thoughts, concerns, and recommendations for what should be done moving forward should you win this election. We'll begin with Sheila Joyce. Thanks, Zach. In terms of the power plant closing, it's due to close within the next 60 days. As you mentioned, there are many aspects of the problem. It's not an easy solution. Um, one of the things that you didn't mention that I'm also concerned about is the uh, employees who are going to lose their jobs. The selectmen were notified last week, two weeks ago, a list of how many positions are going to be eliminated. It was almost 300. Um, we know that quite a few people who work at the plant live in the town so probably two or three months ago at the select boards meeting there was a list of if you want to call it quasi demands that the committee wanted to present to Holtec and Entergy and I said what about the employees so I said in terms of you know training uh, retraining retooling uh, from what I understand these people make a, a decent living which more power to them and how can we help them transition from one career to the other. 
in terms of the, the, the safety, the decommissioning, is Holtec a viable company or not? Um, I have to place some faith in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they know what they're doing. Um, safety is a primary, number one priority in terms of uh, making sure that there's no slip-ups or, you know, dropped issues that don't get attended to. It's going to be a collaborative effort. We're not in the driver's seat, and we just need to stay engaged so we can get as much information as we can and share it with the town. Thank you. We'll move on to Frank Mann next. I was at the recent Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, NDCAP, I think I refer to it as, and uh, there were some uh, dismaying situations going on. Uh, a lot of the people that are on that committee now feel that they've lost uh, their leverage. Uh, th that, that committee was always advisory, but they felt they could have real effect on the state and on the process and on the decommissioning process. And now it's been kind of taken uh, at their suggestion by a committee uh, uh, at the state house level, but they feel like they're not hearing everything they need to hear. And one of the big questions is the decommissioning trust fund. For the life of Pilgrim, uh, taxpayers paid into a trust fund that was supposed to be used exclusively, as we understood it, for its decommissioning. Because if you don't have enough money to decommission it, you're going to end up with a white elephant, a radioactive white elephant, there for an extended period of time. So what that money is going to be spent on is a little bit up in the air. And there's also the concern, at least it's my concern, that the town's um, pilot agreement with Entergy, which was going to pay us $13.5 million in the last two years uh, and now will be paid assumably by Holtec will come out of that decommissioning fund. That's a major concern because essentially that's an ethical issue that we should not broach. If we take money out of that decommissioning fund for our own benefit, then what other monies can be taken out for other uh, extraneous expenses? It's a big concern because a lot of people really believe that there's not enough money there right now to decommission it properly. So there's a lot of concerns there and you know our attention needs to be focused on that. And of course there's also the issue of uh, the 1500 acres. Maybe we'll get to that later in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Anthony Provenzano. Yeah, thanks. The uh, opportunity we have with Holtec uh, taking uh, hold of that plant is to avoid what they call safe store, which is a decommissioning process to keep that plant in mothballs for upwards of 60 years. The Holtec uh, initiative is to do a rapid decommissioning that could have the decommission process, which is really just a dismantling of the, of the power plant and a cleanup of the site over more like a 20 year process. I think the bigger issue is putting the pressure on the federal government to get the spent fuel rods off that site. Right now, most of the environmentalists and most of the politicians who I speak to uh, take it as a fait accompli that, that those rods could stay there for upwards of 250 years. That is completely unacceptable to the town of Plymouth. I think we have to advocate constantly to, uh, to see that our federal officials fulfill the promises they made to us back in the Nuclear, Power, uh, the Nuclear Storage Act of uh, 1984. Uh, Holtec also provides an opportunity because they have a long-term or at least an interim storage facility uh, in production in New Mexico. Um, I think the day that the last fuel rod leaves this town is a very happy day and the sooner that happens the better. As to the 50, 1,500 acres, I think we need a balanced approach. Some open space, some um, uh, residential, and, uh, and some industrial. We uh, sorely lack an industrial base in this town. We are losing some of the very highest paying jobs in this town when these uh, 600 people uh, lose their jobs uh, with an operating nuclear power plant. Uh, if we don't replace them with um, high paying jobs, we're gonna see our children leave. They'll get an education here and then they will be gone. Uh, I'd like to see us diversify our economic base so that we don't lose the next generation uh, walking out the door because there's simply no opportunity in the town of Plymouth. Thank you. Move on to Alan Costello. I wish I was a little better versed on the nuclear power plant. Uh, I have been following it, and I have been following the, uh, the uh, introduction of Holtec to this situation in the last six months. Uh, I'm nervous uh, that the town uh, has lost its seat at the table. There's very little that they can do uh, to determine what the full outcome will be here. Uh, we have to hope that uh, Entergy does the right thing by us and transfers uh, any, anything they would have done for us with Holtec and that they honor it. But I see that 
We're going to be in some hot water with that. <coughs> My biggest problem is the uh, spent fuel rods. I don't understand, and, and I, I will learn this hopefully as we go, but um, I don't understand why if we have those rods on the same piece of property, why we can't still derive a uh, pilot agreement or monies as long as, that they, as long as they are there and under the supervision of a federally licensed company, whoever that might be, whether it's Entergy or Holtec. Uh, but I just have to say, I, I've been watching from afar, but I, I, I don't understand the uh, logistics, quite honestly, of this sale or merger. Uh, at this at this time, it, it, it confuses me that we've, or not we've let it happen, but someone has let it happen, and it's taken some of the options that we had, at least I thought we had, away from us. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll move on to Patrick Flaherty. Yeah, thank you. Now, and this is one thing that <coughs> I have appreciated, just going to school with so many people here that have spent years dedicated to calling out the NRC, calling out Entergy, diving into this whole tech agreement. I was at the NDCAP meeting as well with Frank. And there's some people in this town that really understand this thoroughly. And it's just, they're just residents. And uh, those are the people I've been learning from. And there's a couple things, like I agree with Tony and every single other person in Plymouth, and for that matter, South Shore and Cape, that let's get them out of here. If we can get the rods out of here as they were supposed to be promised to be gone, yeah, number one, great. But as long as we are a spent fuel rod host site, I think that we should fight to make sure that at least the emergency operations budget is provided by whoever's owning the property that those uh, dry casts will be sitting on. Um, you know, secondly, I think it's important that the more strict Department of Public Health residual radiation levels are where we focus our, um, the ultimately that the site becomes, instead of the more lenient NRC levels, I think it's 10, now this is where I, I get over my pay grade, but it's 10, like whatever the level is, is millirens, milli thank you, <laughs> for uh, Department of Public Health, and for the NRC it's 25, so it just seems like we should at least be treated equally as our, our own Department of Public Health um, would treat any other radio, uh, radioactive producing site. Um, and then finally, I think, into the issue of the jobs and this very important economic piece of our, our town leaving, it all comes down to economic development. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in, uh, later on, but it's a focus of uh, what do we do with that land is so important, and you know, we'll get to that in a bit, I'm sure. Thank you. We'll move on to Melissa for the next question. Thank you. And the next question is about housing and economic development. Oh, okay. <laughs> New housing developments are being built in Plymouth, but still there's limited affordable housing. What do you see as the select board's role in addressing the community's concern that young people and seniors cannot afford to buy a home or live in Plymouth? And we'll begin with Frank Mann. Affordable housing is a hot button issue, definitely. And the problem in Plymouth has not been that we don't want to deal with it, but we haven't dealt with it. What we're seeing oftentimes uh, focus on some of the hot the places now that are happening, the uh, Long Pond Road and the uh, Whitehorse Beach development, um, is these are like last developments of last resort. They, they weren't thought out as affordable housing to begin with. They were almost punitive in their nature. The, the Home Depot site specifically uh, was uh, developed or projected to be a totally different development five, six years ago. Then it changed again, and then finally it's an affordable housing development. And what we really need is long-range planning. We have to get the best developers, both of residential and the best developers of light commercial, and bring them together on the best sites and plan this long-term in the future. We can't let this be pushed by developers that want to make a buck or are, can't find another use for their property. We can't put people that, workforce people that need affordable housing in locations where we wouldn't want to live. The, the example again on Home Depot, that site has now been scraped of all its trees, the sand has been removed, it's been flattened, and now it's a good housing development? Rather, if we had planned ahead, we would have had the opportunity to have the topography, the trees, and essentially a much better place to live available for affordable housing. So I think this is really a matter of planning. I think that's my focus on a, on a lot of the issues. We have to have long-range planning. We have to have 
bring together the best developers, not just be happening as a last resort. Thank you. We'll move on to Anthony Provenzano. Yeah, this is, this is a challenge for the town because uh, we have challenges for economic development, we have challenges for housing. Part of our cha challenge with these affordable housing slash uh, workforce housing initiatives is that we are lumped in with a uh, census track that brings us all the way into Boston. So the folks who uh, qualify for um, subsidized housing, affordable housing, really are, have a wage that is higher than the average in Plymouth. Uh, which is kind of odd. Um, also, some of what exists in Plymouth that really is affordable does not count towards our affordable housing quota. So for instance, we have uh, uh, trailer, you know, uh, m manufactured homes mm -hmm. in town who are, that are very affordable, but those uh, do not uh, work towards our quota. We have a planning board that basically uh, handles a lot of these issues, but where the board of selectmen, where the select board can go in is basically to, uh, to be a bully pulpit to uh, see if we can be flexible and uh, more creative in the way that we approach some of these uh, industrial commercial areas. Frank talked about the Home Depot. Uh, uh, that was a change in zoning, thinking that we were going to be bringing in more retail. Well, I got news for you. We don't need more retail. You can see in town there's, there's plenty of retail, about as much retail as we can absorb. Uh, what we do need is more light industrial, more uh, uh, development that brings jobs in. And uh, perhaps one of the things we should be thinking about in that exit five area is taking what is now a, um, uh, a retail corridor that is struggling uh, and rethink it to try to bring in uh, some development using that same infrastructure, uh, but that can bring jobs into the town. Thank you. We'll move on to Alan Costello. Yes, uh, as far as affordable housing, it's a, it's, it's a difficult uh, challenge, as others have said. Uh, we only at this time have 3% of the stocks mm -hmm. that we need. The state would like to see us for all the criteria to be at, at 10%. But it's not an easy fix. I think Plymouth as a whole has a problem in its growth. There's a ton of residential growth, and it has somewhat of a negative impact on some things. Unfortunately, it's not addressing all this growth. It's not addressing the affordable housing to the levels that we need it to. So we have to go back and get the planning board and the different uh, zoning boards and, and different boards that permit and get them on some sort of track so we can plan these long-term uh, uh, big developments that take care of affordable housing in the right locations around town, the right project for the, for the, um, for the affordable housing. Uh, it, it's a major problem. It has to be dealt with. Uh, it's very difficult, as, as Mr. Provenzano said, to fit the criteria if we have, uh, you know, the rental uh, prices of Boston in our equation. So we have to do at the state level, work our way out of that so we become uh, a little bit of our own entity, and I think that might help clear, up, clear it up uh, going forward to some degree. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Patrick Clarity. Thank you. No, and for me, it's about Plymouth staying in control of its own destiny. So, you know, with regards to affordable housing, I get excited because we have some great professionals that work as employees for the town of Plymouth, and it's time we got to explore new ideas, out of the box type of thinking. So, one thing that Plymouth has, we've got a lot of land, and the issue with a lot of developers and the price of the housing that they are building has to do with the price of the land that they have. So let's get creative. I, you know, I'm not a developer, but talking to people and just trying to throw things out there, what if we as Plymouth created the idea where instead of having a 40B type of project, which would come in and put a lot of infrastructure issues in one area, as a town, if we work towards having 1% of that 10% required amount that would then block all 40B uh, permits of year-round uh, affordable housing, we can then control our own destiny. So as Plymouth, let's have maybe an idea like a land auction for developers, where the price of the land would be lower, the product that would be built would be, built, would be set by the town, and the price would be set. That way we can thoughtfully put around town different houses here and there in different locations that make sense and not be one big infrastructure um, crush all at once. And then, um, Really, economic development. I see like housing is tied to economic development. If you create the centers of activity that are interesting, 
a workforce that will become rooted with a quality of life, you will have employers follow. Like anecdotally, I talked to several business owners. They are having a tough time getting a workforce. Instead of going out and trying to attract a specific industry or a specific company, which is kind of the tendency that people say, well, go get Amazon to come here. Let's create an environment that businesses will want to invest in. If we build a strong community, the businesses will want to come and invest in Plymouth with their new locations. Thank you. We'll move on to Sheila Joyce. Thank you. A very sensitive issue. Plymouth doesn't do a good job. What I want to say in terms of affordable, also workforce housing. Um, affordable housing, workforce housing, they're a little bit different, a little bit similar. <clears throat> As Tony said, we get lumped in with Boston. The income is around $81,000. Um, the average income in Plymouth is not anywhere near $81,000. How can the select board help move that along? Uh, when Mr. Cohane has presented different articles for CPC, one of the key aspects of CPC is supposed to be for housing. Um, I sit on the Capital Outlay Committee as well as on the board, obviously, and when he makes presentations, I ask, where's the housing piece of the, uh, of the puzzle, of the proposal? <clears throat> so I think there needs to be a little more uh, concerted effort there. I know that they're uh, working with the Affordable Housing Authority in terms of a project for a couple of million dollars. What else can the town do? Uh, recently, the town meeting approved a second town planner for the town. Uh, Lee Hopman, who's the director of that department, had two people, I guess in the economic downturn, 2008, 2009. They eliminated one of the positions, so we've been out without that second position for quite a while, and um, it was just approved. So hopefully that will be a little bit of an impetus to, to get the momentum going. <coughs> and. Um, Grants, as Patrick said, there's a lot of land in town. You know, how can we do it, whether it's infrastructure? I would like to see more concentration of potential housing on, on the sewer line, so more users can get onto the sewer line as well, which would help that aspect as well as well our operations. And um, we have somewhere between 3 and 4%, as Alan said. We're supposed to be at 10. We need to get increments, and we have a long way to go, I think. Thank you all for your responses. We have Zach with the next question. Thank you, Melissa. Now go on to question four. What do you see as the impact of commercial and residential growth in our community, and what will you do to protect our natural resources for residents and future generations? We'll start with Anthony Provenzano. Sure. Um, you're right. It's a balance. We have to balance the economic growth we need and preserve the natural resources we have. Um, this town is unique in that we have basically an urban core, the north, the downtown, and then we have beautiful rural pastoral areas. So the challenge is to create economic growth where you already have development. You have vibrant <coughs> industrial parks that can be more vibrant. We have um, sewer district, which can be um, where development can occur rather than having sprawl and spread. So um, I think the challenge we face as a town is to have economic development in areas where um, it already exists, make it more intense, use the sewer plant, which is underutilized as it is, um, and create conditions again for jobs, for local residents to, uh, who, who then can enjoy um, the areas that we have that are that are really gorgeous in this town, uh, the, the state forest and, and other open areas. We've uh, had a concerted effort to buy open space in this town for quite some time, um, and, and that should continue. Um, uh, but uh, we also need to balance the needs of people uh, to work and to recreate. Thank you. Move on to Alan Costello. Residential and commercial development. The residential development, and we have a host of it going on around town, um, is a double-edged sword. If we uh, put these residential developments in that don't have an age restriction, if you have one child in the home, the town is already upside down. The cost to educate a child is fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. The average tax bill is between six and seven. So although we have a lot of residential uh, growth, it, it's not necessarily leading us out of the problems that we have. The commercial development that we have in town 
10, 11, 12 percent is far lower than a, a community of, of our makeup would need. We need to get to 35 to 40 percent commercial. Now, I know that's not a, something you can do overnight. It's certainly not easy. I'm sure historically select boards in the past have worked very hard to achieve that. But we have got to figure out a way to get more commercial development in town to take the burden off the taxpayer. All of the rate rises, raises in taxes fall, unfortunately, on the taxpayer. I think we're at 80 percent. So uh, at this time, uh, I would hope to work collaboratively uh, with a board, the board, the other boards in town. We really have to explore and develop some commercial development to offset the residential. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Patrick Flaherty. Thank you. So I see these two things very much linked. And you, as Tony brought up, it has to do with the, the zoning that's already in place. So the zoning is going to define where we focus. Anyone who's coming in here from a commercial or a new industry standpoint is not going to try and change our zoning. They're going to look at those areas that are already um, appropriate for that. So with that, to have the economic growth and uh, development, it does require housing because this is real. If you do not have a workforce that's going to take the jobs that new companies are going to try and um, Phil, someone coming from Boston is not going to care if it's Plymouth, if it's Kingston, if it's Plimpton, if it's Pembroke, if it's Carver. They're going to look for areas that are interesting where their employees and their workforce is going to be rooted. So Cordage Park is a great example of this happening right now. We have uh, a lot of new uh, residential units that are going to create this anchor for a workforce. And it's going to bolster the strong North Plymouth community. It's going to increase the economy there. And that's the type of things that companies are going to look for when they're coming in and trying to decide where they want to put their next office or their next expansion. So it comes down to quality of life. If we're creating a strong quality of life and a rooted workforce, the, the businesses will come. And importantly, to, uh, on what Alan said, if we're going to do this and set up an attractive area for, for businesses to come, we need to have a streamlined and thoughtful permitting process because I, you know, anecdotally again, I've talked to folks who it is a very arduous task to go through the way the process is set up, the timing of things, just the way it's structured can put a very big burden on getting something moved in and done here in Plymouth. So between the housing anchoring a workforce, the thoughtful and streamlined permitting process, I think those are the two keys that will bolster that commercial uh, economic growth. Thank you. Move on to Sheila Joyce. Thank you. Uh, a tough balance, commercial versus residential. As Alan mentioned, the tax base is about 80 percent derived from residential tax bills. Commercial contributes about 9 percent, and there's other little pockets that contribute the rest of the revenue in town. The um, last five, six, seven years, and we've seen statistics that the commercial base has basically stayed flat. Um, when you think of how can a town this big have no changes in, in appreciable numbers. It's in the 720, 730 range. Um, there's some debate about commercial tax rate versus residential. Should we have a split tax rate? Um, I have advocated for that with the concept of even if it was a you know, 10 percent, uh, 10 cent decrease for residential, kind of give them a break. The uh, negative to that is that, well, that will deter commercial from moving in. I personally don't think it will. If it's it doesn't have to be $20 and $10, but I think it needs to be a little bit of a benefit to uh, the residents. They, they pay the, the bulk of the bill. Um, an example of where I don't think the town makes enough of an emphasis, uh, Jessica Casey was the director of Plymouth Growth and Development, and then she left, went to work for the MBTA, and then they brought in a woman, Judy Barrett. Uh, Judy Barrett left, I think, probably a year ago, maybe even more of a year ago. She was in the position not a long time. This position is supposed to help do some liaison and, and get businesses in town. That position is now filled by a part-time, uh, you know, interim person. The response I've heard is that it doesn't pay enough. The town needs to make a concerted effort, upgrade the job, and get someone in. So the focus is that. Work with Lee Hartman's new planning person and get some energy and get it going. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we'll move on to Frank Mann. Uh, it may be by bias, I am a, a member of board of directors of the Pine Barrens Alliance in town, but I heard the question as more how do we protect our open space, how do we protect our environment uh, from growth and development? Because I think that's what's happening more so than our open space is infringing on our growth and development. 
I think our quality of life, I think our air and water are in jeopardy and, and our, the feeling we have of what community we came and wanted to live in are in jeopardy. And that's the question as I heard it. And one of the things I think we need to do is we need to really embrace what our identity is as a community. We do know and we understand that we're a very historic community, but we are also a remarkable environmental community. There are so many wonderful organizations that are doing research right now that are raising hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Today I was uh, at the, uh, it wasn't the groundbreaking, but there was an Earth Day ceremony along the town brook, and it was all about what work has been done, what fabulous has work has been done, the grant money that's come in to remove dams, restore the, the herring run, and restore that wonderful area at the center of town. We've been doing that in many, many places in town. But again, I'll mention the, the Mass Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary. In its first year, 35,000 people came to that site. And was that with new pipes and new structures and high rises? Was it like a foxwoods? No, it was a place where basically they restored the stream and they allowed people access to the beauty that's here. We undervalue completely our environmental value in this town, our environmental heritage, the legacy we have of a rare ecosystem, of rare species, of beautiful streams, 430 ponds. Those things are the key to ecotourism, which brings people in that want to stay more than a day, and the key to many other things. It's the key to research. Thank you. <laughs> we'll now move on to Melissa for the next question. Thank you. Our fifth question is next. Marijuana legislation in Massachusetts has come with both economic opportunity and un un unanticipated issues. As a select board member, what role do you think local government should play in the sale and distribution of recreational marijuana? We'll start with Alan Costello. As far as the marijuana question, uh, I, uh, back two years ago, I believe it was in the state uh, ballot, voted against it. but. The town of Plymouth voted for it. So I'm firmly uh, in favor of getting the shop set up as quickly as we can, set up all our host agreements, derive the tax that we would receive as a town, and let the business or the businesses run the way that they feel they should run. It's a capitalist society. Uh, I think we should let them open up. I, I think we're allowed for at this time. We might be allowed five. I think we're on the borderline of it. But I would recommend getting them open as quickly as possible in the three or four light industrial sections of town that we have allocated in a certain bylaw to put them in. And uh, let the business uh, sort, sort it out for themselves. And as residents uh, who voted for it, they can use the service. And as a taxpayer, uh, I can or we can uh, put the money back into the uh, town coffers and get along with the business of marijuana. It's, it's been voted on, it was approved, and I say let's, let's, let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Patrick Flaherty. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm in agreement with the, the idea. Yeah, it is voted on, it's approved. Now it's up to us to do it safely and thoughtfully rolling out in Plymouth. Uh, my next door neighbor of my office in the industrial park is one of the approved uh, recreational marijuana stores. And so they, uh, you know, it was kind of, they had these open meetings where it was anyone in the neighborhood could come. And it was right when they had all the stories of the lines down the highway of people and all kind of the, the infrastructure type of chaos. And I walked up and I, they're like, we're going to make sure we have parking, we're going to make sure we have all this thing set up. They really were trying to be accommodating to the business in the area. And I just said, well, you know, frankly, you're starting a business. Uh, you're following the rules. You are going to, you're accommodating the area. You know, good, good luck to you. You know, this, this is what we voted as a town, and, and I, I support that, but safely and thoughtfully. And let's, as a town, take the taxes from it and put this towards some of the other issues that we were talking about uh, ongoing as a benefit for the town. So. Uh, yeah, let's move forward, but safely, thoughtfully, and uh, my experience, at least so far, with uh, one of those has, was very positive in terms of their being a, uh, a good neighbor in the community. Thank you. Next is Sheila Joyce. Thank you. In terms of the marijuana issue, as Alan said, I was the same. I voted against it personally. The town voted it in 52 percent, 48 percent, so it's time to support it. 
Uh, we've had various companies, marijuana growers, transporters, all different kinds of people present to the Board of Selectmen in the last year, year and a half. Um, right next door to PAC TV is Triple M, and they just reopened on Saturday. And uh, they were shut down for a variety of reasons with the state, and I was glad to hear that Triple M did open in terms of medicinal services. Um, I took a tour of the building. It's unbelievable what they have poured into the building electrically, money-wise, employees, equipment, and let's start collecting it. We need additional sources of revenue and we need to do it. In terms of what should the town's role be with these businesses, um, they've done various outreaches to the police chief, the fire, traffic and safety are two of my concerns in terms of making sure that we don't have the traffic in the lines. In terms of security, the building is highly secure in terms of Triple M. I haven't had the opportunity to take tours of the other locations. And again, safety is a priority. But it's here, it's here to stay, and let's make the most of it and be a partnership with the business. And who knows, when we've had different people come to the board, they had a transportation company. A couple of weeks ago, I saw a presentation on the planning board of a company that just wants to be a courier for cash. There's all different kinds of offshoots, and let's welcome them into the town as long as they thoughtfully plan their business and communicate with the, the town manager, the select board, the police, and the fire. And it's a win for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Frank Mand. Thank you. I think I agree with all my uh, uh, fellow uh, candidates here today that uh, this is uh, a very straightforward issue. It's legal. Uh, it's potentially a tax revenue, a, a, a good source of that. Um, I, I look at the history of the town over the last uh, 15 years. I covered the Board of Select Persons uh, in the last 10 years, and I never saw a liquor license turned down. There are now 125 or so liquor licenses in town. Uh, and I guess you you have to say that it's been good for the town. Uh, probably back 10, 12 years ago, people were worried about that. Uh, but responsible businesses that are regulated by the state and other authorities, uh, a responsible government uh, has reviewed them and, and keeps watch over them. And I view the same as marijuana. It's a cultural issue for me. Marijuana is not a big deal. I understand people's concerns, especially in this age of uh, opiate addiction. I don't believe it's a gateway drug per se. Uh, I believe uh, it's more, gateway drug is more a societal issue, but I truly believe that we should treat this normally. I truly believe that we should have this not only in the light industrial parks, but recreational all should be allowed in other areas as well. Uh, I think we are intelligent and that we can supervise this and we can do it well. And uh, I think we should move forward, uh, enough discussion of it, let's move forward uh, in a rational way. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now go to Anthony Provenzano. Yeah. In 2016, the people of the Commonwealth uh, voted in a referendum whether or not to have regulated uh, sale of recreational marijuana. And the town of Plymouth, by 52 to 48, uh, voted in favor. Uh, that referendum included a provision that gave local control and allowed the people of the town to make a determination whether they wanted to have a moratorium or whether they wanted to ban the sale of retail marijuana in their town. Um, I supported hearing from the people of the town of Plymouth because I'm not entirely convinced that the political class uh, of this town is necessarily in tune with the people of the town. Uh, so I think it's really quite frankly to the eternal shame of the board that we didn't allow to hear from the people. Now you've heard from Frank, um, the next move, uh, this town has taken steps to limit the uh, location of retail marijuana to light industrial parks. But the next move will be to have uh, retail establishments in the other commercial zones of the town. And quite frankly, I would like to hear from the people of the town before we make that, that move. Um, uh, the uh, analogy to the uh, liquor licenses, well, Frank, we have in fact uh, denied some liquor licenses. Um, but the other difficulty that I have is the folks who come before us uh, to get host agreements aren't necessarily the entities that end up operating the places. As we found recently, we were made a very, very elaborate presentation by folks who uh, represented themselves as uh, wanting to run a retail marijuana uh, um, operation. But the ink was not even dry on the uh, uh, host agreement before we found out that in fact, uh, that entity was under agreement from a larger national company. Um, marijuana is here to stay, I would guess. 
Um, and in fact, it may go national. And if it goes national, the uh, entire uh, regime that we've been dealing with is going to change radically. So I'd also <coughs> caution that this town not get too addicted to the revenue because it could disappear. Thank you all. And we'll go back to Zach. At this point, we'll turn the questions and comments over to our candidates. Candidates, we're going to give each of you the opportunity to ask a question to another candidate. You will have 30 seconds to ask your question. Questions must be directly related to issues facing the town and or the candidate's position on these issues. The responding candidate will be given the standard two minutes for their response. Patrick Flaherty, you are first to ask your question. So one question to one person? One question mm -hmm. to any candidate. Um, oh, cool. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll ask Sheila. In the, the last three years of your uh, being on the board, you know, what was one of the accomplishments or things or issue that you feel proud of that you, you know, worked to move towards uh, you know, for Plymouth? So I'll share two uh, that I'm proud of. Anybody who has watched me on the meetings or even as an advisory finance committee member, town meeting member, I ask questions, I do my homework, I dig facts. And the transparency of sharing facts has increased exponentially. Um, we do not vote on things if we don't have the facts. I, if I don't have the, uh, either the thorough amount of facts or, gee, I still have some questions that were unanswered, I don't vote on it. I ask the chair to postpone it. As an example, uh, just before Christmas, Jonathan Beter and his uh, sewer department made a presentation about the transition to Veolia when they were leaving in 2021. We probably had about a 150-page report to go through, and they made a presentation that lasted about 45 minutes. And I said, I am not voting on this, listening to a presentation for 45 minutes for something that's going to impact the town for the 20, 30, 40, 50 years out there. Um, we had more time to get questions answered. We did more research, and they came back after Christmas. And we had another discussion about the operations and, and the transitions. Another thing that I'm very proud about, and some people don't agree with me, Town Hall is back open one night. I live in Plymouth. I work in Cambridge. I cannot do things at Town Hall that we're all paying for by pulling into the Kingston train station at 6 o'clock at night. So when the town hall was being planned, um, I strongly urged the town manager to get it back open one night. I did a survey of 15, 20 towns on the South Shore. We were the only one who was not open at night, which I thought was a disgrace. And we are the biggest town by far. It's now open till 6.30 at night. Some people like it, some people don't. But when I'm in there, it's nice to see citizens coming in and doing their business. Thank you for your answer. Now, Sheila, it is your opportunity to ask a candidate a question. Sure, so I'll return the favor back to Patrick. <laughs> um, so I had the opportunity to work with Patrick on some uh, Plymouth growth and development in terms of the, the, the parking, Park Plymouth. So um, Patrick, you know, you, you've been involved with the board for a couple of years. How do you see the town solving the uh, downtown parking problem? Um, and if you could just share with the viewers the uh, Court Street purchase that you were interested in and, and, you know, what was good about that or what was not good about that. Sure. Yeah, and it's definitely uh, it's a pickle. And to give some background to my professional experience, uh, four years ago I was asked by the select board to join the Plymouth Growth and Development Corporation board uh, based on my experience working with uh, the cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Atlanta, Chicago in their municipality park parking programs. That was how I first uh, came onto the board. And um, over the last years it's you know, you think you're working with Los Angeles and the issues that are there, you think, oh, Plymouth, that'll be cute, you know? <laughs> it is uh, so complex because we're in a, uh, a high demand season for three and a half months and then a very low demand. So the, the issue is that you, you don't necessarily have the, the financials to support a, uh, the parking structures that would traditionally be able to be put up to uh, address the, the demand. And uh, so uh, Park Plymouth for the, as long as I've been on the board, has been trying to find an alternative to the uh, rental, the lease that is had for its office. And it's a very limited area because we need to be within a footprint, we need to be within uh, walking distance for all the, uh, the workers. And so that opportunity came up to be explored. Um, the, the 134 Court Street, uh, we went through, did a lot of due diligence, come to find out 
there was a lot of issues with that building um, in terms of the maintenance and the repairs that would have had to go into it. And after really a thoughtful process, we determined that that was not the best uh, decision to move forward with for the Park Limit offices. So we remained in our uh, current offices, but, um, but really I, I think that uh, what I'm proud of is that the businesses that are in downtown Plymouth and on the, on the waterfront, uh, over the last couple of years we've worked very uh, diligently to get their feedback. So there was a great discussion last year with the waterfront businesses. We just had another uh, open community forum with the businesses in downtown about Middle Street Lot and it's in engaging those businesses to uh, determine what they want as I see as our, our right. job. Thank you. Now Frank Mann, this is your opportunity to ask a fellow candidate a question. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll ask Alan Costello a uh, question because he brought up, uh, well he acknowledged that he's a member of the a committee that is working to uh, see a change in our form of government. Uh, the title of that committee I think is called the Plymouth Government Transition Committee. And that assumes, I think, that a transition is both necessary and will happen, uh, or at least it suggests that, implies that. And while I don't agree, I'd like to know uh, what form of government uh, he prefers and why it would be an improvement. Thank you for the question. Uh, I apologize, I didn't think it had government in there. I think it was the transitional charter. Oh, maybe Plymouth Charter Transition. Transition. And that was our hope, and that is continue, will continue to be our hope, that we put the, uh, w the idea out there, we gather the 15% uh, of the required registered voters to get, simply to get a question on the ballot in 2020. I think uh, based on a lot of the answers we heard today, we've tried a lot of things, we've exceeded the state guidelines, uh, even though they're not hard and fast, but we've gone by 35,000 people years ago. We're in excess of 60,000 people. We're dealing with a budget two weeks ago, a quarter of a billion dollars by all good people, but volunteers, some with some expertise, some with uh, not, not so much financial expertise, but conservation and, and, and bylaws and things of that nature. It's a great group. I like. Uh, representative town meeting. But we would be kidding ourselves or we'd be doing a disservice for the residents if we didn't explore other things, Frank. I'm not, and I don't think anyone in the committee is advocating for any particular government at this time. No one's suggesting a mayor. Uh, there's probably five or six types of governments we can have. We can have strong uh, Mayor, weak mayor, strong town council, weak town council, there's a host of different things. I don't know if a mayor will solve all the problems. Uh, however, I think continuing to do the same thing is not working. And we're very close to uh, a pretty chaotic time where we're going to have to make some major cuts or have an override. And that's not going to go over well. So in that same time frame, let's at least explore some other options. Thank you. Move on, Anthony Permanzano. It's your turn to ask a follow-up. Sure, candidate. I'm going to keep you on it. All right. So we go. <laughs> uh, we've been very, very successful in the last um, uh, couple of years. We've gotten federal money for uh, dredging. Uh, we have now gotten state money for dredging. We have uh, matched that with town funds. Uh, could you uh, uh, talk to us about how that's going to help the downtown harbor and what the next steps in the harbor plan are that you think that the town should go forward on? I think that's a um, great result. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of $19 million worth of dredging for Plymouth Harbor to a, uh, a bill to the taxpayer of $2.5 million. It's a heck of a good deal. The harbor is a huge asset to the town. Now this talk of small, medium-sized cruise ships coming in, and that may very well happen, but that's not going to turn the tide for us single-handedly. No pun intended. There you go. <laughs> Very shot. But there was a, uh, an article in, I believe it was the February Economist, where there's a host of uh, foreign companies with some American uh, partners that are gearing up and getting ready for a huge uh, wind farm infrastructure in and around the Cape. So I think, to Tony's point, that Plymouth could be maybe not a deep water harbor that we're going to see a lot of equipment come through, mm -hmm. but you're going to see a lot of workers a lot of service industry. So 
The fact that we've put the harbor in good order at this time for the next 70 years by all accounts, because the last time we were dredged was 50 to 70 years ago, I think it's a great thing for the town. And whoever did the work, and I know it was multi-year, mm -hmm. over the last 20 years, 30 years, they deserve a huge amount of credit. Uh, but those are the type of things that I think if we had a single point of, uh, of government, you would actually be at the seat uh, or at the table for a lot of those type of grants and a lot of those initiatives because people at the state level, people that give out the monies, they tend to, this is just one, one point of a different form of government, they tend to develop a relationship with a single, uh, I don't want to use the word mayor because I don't want to taint it, but with a single point of our local government. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Now it is your opportunity. You have 30 seconds to ask a question. I, I was going to give Tony a softball, but no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a softball. I let you shine. No, I understand. I, I we we that. need to stick. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, honestly, I was, I was going to ask Tony uh, a lot on the same lines as uh, Sheila was asked in his tenure as, as a selectman. Uh, what is the high point uh, that, that you achieved? Let me ask you what the low point is, and then as the softball, what is the uh, typical week in the life of a selectman if mm -hmm. one of us are lucky enough to achieve a spot? Yeah, the high point is probably also the low point. That uh, sewer force main break uh, was, uh, you know, when you're sitting in church on a Sunday morning and your phone explodes and you're finding out that there's raw sewerage pouring out onto somebody's private land and uh, there's got to be an immediate response. In the next two weeks, you've got a conga line of trucks that are running from the, uh, the pump station and bringing it up to the sewer plant because your force main has been destroyed. Uh, and then you have to make some very, very difficult decisions on uh, what to do to respond, um, whether to go with you know column A, column B, column C, and column C's numbers just knock your socks off, but you know it's the right thing to do. So you vote to do it. And then you have to come up with a, a financing response and now we're embroiled in this lawsuit. So, uh, you know, it was a low point, but also I think we responded extremely well. Uh, I think we've got ourselves out of a very, very difficult position. And now it's time to really close the chapter, do the book, uh, you know, make it happen uh, because we have this, uh, our town council did an excellent job creatively bringing all the parties to the table uh, and keeping them there. Uh, so now we have to close the deal. Um, what's the typical um, week like? Well, there is no typical week. One thing, there is a, uh, uh, a standard. You get the package on a Friday afternoon. You absorb it over the weekend. Uh, you do your homework. I can tell you that uh, of, the, of the members of the board that I've been privileged to uh, serve with, nobody does their homework better than, than Sheila. Nobody comes in better prepared than Sheila. Uh, she really turns over every little rock, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and then there are other, there are places to be. I'll tell you, one of the, as you may have noticed, I've had my arm in a sling in the last six weeks, and I'll tell you, it's been like hell, because I haven't been able to get around to all the places that sorry, I'd like to be. Yeah, yeah I know, I know, I got on a roll, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so since we have a little, a uh, few more minutes, we want to give you the opportunity to either speak about a topic that has not been addressed, or speak to questions or comments that were addressed earlier in the forum. Again, this is not a debate. You will have two minutes, and we'll start with Sheila Joyce. Um, in terms of things that haven't been addressed, one thing that uh, I'm concerned about is the school system. We have a fabulous school system. We have 12 schools. The budget hit over $100 million this year. Um, our school population continues to go down. When I moved into town 16 years ago, it was well over 9,000. Now it's 73, 7,400. The teachers do a fabulous job. I had the opportunity to go to Japan a couple of years ago and I went with three teachers. They were fabulous. They were so engaged and, and so interested. The students, my husband and I don't have any children, um, and I was just amazed at how intelligent these young men and women were. Um, well behaved, good representatives of the town, but it's a declining population. How do we balance those budget needs? Um, we have a huge transportation challenge that we don't get a lot of reimbursement from the state. Um, Funds decrease. There's a huge technology gap. Um, Dr. Maestas and Dr. Costin has said that the technology in the school, in terms of what the students have during the day, um, 
very obsolete. Um, I've looked at the numbers. The numbers are there's over 9,000 devices and between teachers and students there's a little less than that. So it's a huge challenge. Um, I think even though Mass General Law says the, the school department can kind of do their uh, planning in a, I don't want to say in a vacuum, but on their own type of thing. It's a talented school committee. It's a very talented administration. And I think we need to have more collaboration between the two parties so we can have a good product. Um, we're now spending over $17,000 per pupil, which is well over the state average. How do we make the best of that and as well as balance it with the budget? Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to Frank Mann. Uh, it's been mentioned, but I'd like to bring back up the 1,500 acres, the so-called 1,500 acres, which was a buffer, or still is a buffer, around the uh, workings of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant. That property includes um, one of the rarest, un most unique ecosystems in uh, Massachusetts, and is also the highest point between Mount Cadillac in Acadia National Park in Maine and North Carolina. It is a vista worth millions and it shouldn't be sold to people that can afford million dollar homes. It should be in the public's interest, it should be in the public side and I think we need to act soon and aggressively to make sure that that piece of property is acquired by the town one way or another. There are many many groups environmental and otherwise residential, the Pine Hills I'm sure the residential developers is interested in, of course, the town is interested in as well. And I believe a, a, a beautiful compromise can be reached with that because that property can retain its ecological significance. The ridge should never be sold, it should always remain in its pristine state as much as possible. But there's also the opportunity for some expansion potentially of residential and for light commercial or industrial. I believe a beautiful compromise can happen there that will benefit everyone in the community will cement our environmental heritage, will link up to the Foothills Preserve, which is the town's, the Mass Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, potentially the land uh, uh, along the Eel River and the county woodlot, and all the way to the Miles Standish State Forest. I believe that that piece of property is, is critical to the town's future, and we should not lose sight of that, and we should move aggressively to make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Now move on to candidate Provenzano. I think it's Maguntacut, not uh, it's not Cadillac. It's uh, Mount Maguntacut. Okay. Yeah, but <laughs> a, we won't quibble over that. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about, we, we may or may not talk about in upcoming debates, is uh, some of the financial challenges facing the town with regard to its unfunded liability for f uh, for pension and its unfunded liability for uh, other post-employment benefits. The, these numbers are um, are, are truly um, sobering. Uh, I believe that at last count the uh, unfunded liability on um, pension was 150 some odd million. I did email the, uh, 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 the director of finance today to see if the latest actuarial figures uh, were out. The last uh, count on the unfunded liability on other post-employment benefits were I believe up to 597 million. Uh, the town has a plan to deal with the unfunded liability on pension insofar as we have a $14 million line item in that 200 and some odd million dollar budget, uh, which is scheduled to go up at a rate of 8% per year uh, over the next uh, several, uh, next decades or so, uh, so that by, I believe, 2038, uh, we will have that unfunded liability uh, fully uh, retired, so long as market conditions are uh, consistent with what we hope. We have no real plan to deal with that um, unfunded liability on the uh, post-employment benefits other than to throw a relatively modest amount of money which will never uh, be enough to really deal with it. So I think that's one of the challenges uh, uh, we face as a board and that uh, any of you might face as you find yourself um, sitting on the board. Thank you. We'll now move on to candidate Costello. Now there's two topics I thought may come up this evening and they may come up as we continue uh, the forum season. Um, and they're sort of tied in together. They're uh, town building infrastructure maintenance and road maintenance. Two things that are near and dear to the present residents today. These are probably number two and three behind taxes uh, that they speak about. Uh, we didn't talk about it here, and, and, and I don't uh, put any of the blame on 
the, the present board, but as a town meeting member, I'm surprised that a lot of times we vote money in for some projects, and the project doesn't materialize. And then we see it back in, for, uh, in front of us two or three years later. Um, the price tag is doubled. There's been some examples of uh, some projects coming back in, in front of us three times and literally tripling. So it's very discouraging for the taxpayer to see that a relatively manageable problem was not dealt with, and now it's become a crisis. We have to spend the money, and they're upset about it. That's on the building side. There's a host of buildings, of 32 buildings, I believe, depending on who you, what report you look at. And I'm sure it's an overwhelming job to keep all 32 buildings on the town side up to snuff. But we as a town haven't done a good job at it. I'm going to make that one of my key uh, uh, topics, issues to uh, get involved with and keep my eye on, as well as roads. And roads, uh, uh, everybody has the same complaint. The roads are lousy this time of year. There's not enough money to put back into the roads. But uh, we've got to do something for the average taxpayer that tries to navigate around town all year long. We've got to address the problem for them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we move on to Patrick Flaherty. Nailed it, Alan. Buildings. I think that was the one I was <laughs> expecting to come up. There's been a lot of coverage on it. <laughs> And I think it's, it's looking at ideas that have worked. So, okay, meals tax, great example of what can uh, produce uh, a beautiful town hall that did not have any taxpayers' dollars coming out of it. Uh, it's doing really well. What if we took that meals tax, we eliminate the sunset on it, and designate that to be for facilities maintenance and, and improvements? Um, another thing that gets me, and Alan, yeah, you're all over it. It's the idea that you could have a capital project, which is any project that has at least a five-year lifespan or $15,000 of total expense that has to go before a yearly process. There's a capital outlay expenditure committee that ha does a ranking, which really pits the departments against each other within our own town. Uh, but the one that really stands uh, alone is that facilities maintenance uh, director. I would want to explore working with our professionals and the town meeting and see can we set aside a budget for that facilities maintenance director that he can operate from. He's a professional, he knows what he's doing, and now that department is growing, we have an operations manager, and do something real about it. Give him a budget, say you can have a, a planned expense from um, you know, a certain amount, we're going to plan to do that anyway for each year in our budget, and, and just let him do what needs to be done when it needs to get done. Uh, there's a couple examples that uh, for example, the library roof, go to bid, there's no one that bids. Now we come back, the prices increase, it's $3.2 million now. Uh, these are the type of things that if we could be a little bit more nimble, we could get in front of, and that still is within our, our current form of government that we could maybe make some adjustments, but it would take some work to look at this and uh, work with our town professionals. That's what I'm excited to do, is work with our town's professionals and be that advisory board to them to, to make change and, and progress in creative ways. Thank you all. Now move to Melissa for closing remarks. Thank you. Candidates, we are now going to give you two minutes for closing remarks. Feel free to speak directly to the camera to address your voters and constituents. Alan Costello, you are up first. Okay, I'd like again, thank PAC TV for the opportunity this evening. It was a great learning experience. I want to thank the other candidates. I learned a, a lot and I, I think we put our best foot forward. Uh, my platform uh, is very simple. Uh, it's simple in construction, but like anything that matters, will take a lot of hard work by all concerned. First, we must stabilize property taxes through sensible spending. This certainly means tough spending choices will have to be made. The spend and tax gravy train must be derailed now. Second, we must promote new sources of income for the town. We touched on this earlier. This includes creative valuation and implement implementation of non-tax sources of revenue. Very important. We have to help out the taxpayer. More importantly, our commercial tax base of 11 or 12 percent of total tax revenue is totally unacceptable and has led to the tax burden being shouldered largely by the residents. Additionally, continued non-55 plus residential development is a net tax loss for the town, further adding to the tax burden for existing residents. We have no choice but to address this. Third. Our infrastructure, which I just spoke of a short time ago, is in a total state of decay. Deferred maintenance is no longer an acceptable strategy. 
we must adopt a comprehensive infrastructure policy that includes town-owned buildings in a more aggressive road improvement program. This will cost money. It only serves to highlight the need to make tough spending choices in other areas and increase our commercial tax base, most importantly. I hope this evening has helped the viewers see the difference among all of us candidates. Please prioritize voting on May 18th. Your vote this year matters more than ever. I would appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. We'll move on to Patrick. Uh, so the top priority I see for the select board is to provide a safe environment for all residents. And as we've talked about, Plymouth is approaching a financial wall that will affect police, fire, DPW, teachers, town employees' ability to provide their vital services. It's, I've seen how our tax rate has affected uh, our residents, and there's one client specifically that I know that she's lived in her home in Plymouth since the 80s, she's now on a fixed income, and she's struggling to live and afford to live in the town that she loves uh, because of rising taxes and other costs. Uh, her story is not uncommon, and I believe it's a responsibility of Plymouth's government to provide a consistent and stable tax base uh, as much as possible. Um, we can't continue to rely on high taxes of property owners, and we do need visionary leadership to drive economic development. Um, I'm a committed volunteer across several different groups in Plymouth, and that's my way of stepping up to, um, you know, as community service, to give back. And I really see that this select board as a way to give back and continue that sense of service. Uh, for Plymouth to thrive, we, we do need visionary thinking and collaboration without ego. And we need leaders who stand for integrity, humility, and character. I will bring this to the select board. And I'll work with and for every business owner, every employee, every resident across all of Plymouth. And you know, as I've lived here, I, I really come to appreciate Plymouth's rich history, and I'm really loving living now and enjoying our, our vibrant present, but I'm excited about Plymouth's future, and I ask for your vote on May 18th. And for more info about me, you can visit patrick4plymouth.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to Sheila Joyce. Thank you, Melissa and Zach, for hosting us, and thanks to the viewers who have turned in. I represent and work for all of the residents in town. I don't make decisions in a vacuum. I consider myself fiscally conservative. I tell people it's not my money to spend, it's everyone's money, and that is why I do my homework. Please help me continue the work I started in 2016. On Saturday, May 18th, I ask you to please vote for me, Sheila Mary Joyce, I'm number two on the ballot, allowing me to return to the select board for a second term. Let me continue to help increase awareness in the town that we probably can't be all things to all people, we need to work together diligently and honestly so we can be transparent and as fair as possible in deciding how we can meet the residents and the business priorities in town. Plymouth is a unique and wonderful town. Help me to continue making Plymouth a town we are all proud to live in and work in 365 days a year. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to Frank Mann. In a local election, there's a very small window of opportunity for residents to get to know the candidates. So townspeople often vote for individuals who are well known to them, regardless of their stand on the issues. That's why here, and in dozens of posts on a variety of platforms serving our community, I've tried to offer you my view on those hot button issues. But I don't want to get caught in the weeds. I don't want you to be distracted by the challenges we face every day from what I believe is the key issue for Plymouth, planning. Too often, the projects we have undertaken have been in reaction to problems we did not anticipate. We've done a marvelous job of responding when crises occurred, but if we are to move effectively forward, we need a plan, and before that, we need a vision. I don't want to be a caretaker. I don't want to be a ringmaster. I don't want to be part of the bucket brigade putting out the fires. I want to lead. I'm passionate about Plymouth. I have a vision for its future. I ask you to give me the opportunity to represent you by voting for me, Frank, though on the ballot it's my mother's name, Francis, Mand, M-A-N-D, on the May 18th town election. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we'll move on to Anthony Provenzano. Thank you, PAC TV, thank you, Melissa, thank you, Zach, for having us. Uh, These are always great forums to uh, allow us to connect to the people. Um, I also, uh, I think I would be remiss if I did not send out a happy birthday greeting to my wife. Uh, her age is a very, very closely held state secret, but I will say that it ends in a zero this year. Um, 
further, I want to thank the people of the town of Plymouth um, for the confidence that you've shown in me over these past six years. Um, I've worked very hard, uh, and I believe that I have the expertise, I have the experience, um, and I have the passion to um, do the very best job uh, that I can uh, as a member of the board of selectmen, now the select board. Um, please, uh, I can uh, ask you to consider uh, giving me your vote Saturday, May 18, um, and I hope that uh, we have high voter participation this year. Because I said earl as I said earlier in this uh, forum, no form of government will survive uh, well if we don't get uh, strong voter participation. So uh, please get out and vote and uh, consider giving me a vote. I'm number one on the ballot. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to all the candidates for participating in this forum. For our viewers, thank you for joining us. If you are interested in watching replays of our forum, please visit our website, pactv.org slash Plymouth Election, for replay times on the Plymouth Government Channel and to watch the forum on YouTube. For Melissa, myself, the candidates, and all of us at PACTV, thank you for taking the time to join us to learn more about your candidates. And please, ensure your voice is heard. Cast your vote on Saturday, May 18th.